I came here to, to ski and ended up, uh, you know, uh, spending 19 years in pro football and then in the, in the Hall of Fame. Dave Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing for Entrepreneur the Playbook, and I am here with a legend, Jan Stenerud, who I just found out surprisingly was not born in California. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I actually found out uh, something even more interesting that you came to America on a ski scholarship. That's correct. <coughs> and that's what, why California was not in the mix early on, obviously. <laughs> no, I got a ski, ski scholarship from Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. I got, Got a letter from the ski coach in the spring of 1962, and I had finished in the top 10 in the Junior National Ski Jumping Championship in Norway. And they offered me a ski scholarship, and I thought, you know, going to America, the most exciting, most interesting place in the world. So we had a family discussion, and we thought it was a good idea, at least to try it for, for one year. So that must have been Big Sky that you were practicing at, right? Big Sky. Right. I mean, the skiing? Yeah. Now, Big Sky Resort was not around at that point. Okay. Well, is it Bridger? Or? Bridger, you very, Dave, very <laughs> impressive. Uh, Bridger was 15 miles out of Bozeman. Big Sky, as I came to Bozeman in 62, Big Sky opened about, 19, about 10 years later. And the founder was Chet Huntley, as you well know. Yes. The Huntley Brinkley Report. And how. You probably knew nothing of American football in 1962, did you? No, I had never seen, I heard about it, but I'd never seen one. But when I came to Montana State, most of the students went to the game. That was a big thing. And the packed house at Montana State was about 8,000 people. <laughs> but it was exciting. You had the band, you had the cheerleaders, and the people really loved football. I didn't really appreciate it that much. I, I liked basketball better. It was easy for me to understand because in football, it looked like they played for four seconds. <laughs> then he stood around and talked about something for about 30 seconds, and then it appeared to do the same thing again, play for four seconds again. I of course, at Montana that. State, they ran the ball a lot in those days, so it wasn't really interesting to me, but, but it was just a fun experience to go to the game and have fun with the students and the, and the crowd and the entertainment. And how, how did you transition from being a great ski jumper into playing football? Well, as a skier, I ra ran the stadium steps almost every day in the fall to get my legs in, in better shape for, for, uh, for the ski season. And of course, I played a lot of soccer as a kid in Norway. I played soccer in almost every country in the world. And one day, the kicker on the team was down there kicking field goals. And I went down and joined him. I met him, I guess. And I kicked a few of the toe like everybody kicked in those days. Like it's, yeah. you know, like Joel, Dempsey. Dem well, <laughs> you go back to Lou Groza and George Blanda, Fred Cox, Jim Bach, and Jim, Tur Jim Turner, and those guys. And I tried with a toe, like the tennis shoes, and I noticed that I could kick the ball quite a bit further than him, even with the toe, the tennis shoes. So after a few attempts, I asked him, can you kick with the side of your foot? Like you take a quarter kick in soccer, you probably didn't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> but he said, yes, you can. There's a guy for the Buffalo Bills. His name is Pete Gogolak. He kicks with the side of his foot. He had to start. He was the first in pro football. This was in 1964. So I kicked a few, and I did that several times during that fall. And unbeknownst to me, the basketball coach had seen me from his office window. And he ran over and told the football coach, Jim Sweeney, that he said, you got to take a look at this Norwegian skier out there. He's kicking football distances that I really haven't seen before. And the football coach didn't pay much attention. But anyway, right before the last home game of the year in 64, the team was working out at the stadium. And I ran the stadium steps. I wasn't even paying much attention to it. And all of a sudden, Jim Sweeney, the football coach, yelled to me, say something like, hey, skier, get down here. Here, skier. You can, here you can kick. So that was the first time I really kicked in front of the team. And, and I guess he liked what he saw, because after uh, oh, about 10 kicks or so, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, uh, I don't think he knew my name. He said, uh, young man, what are you doing tomorrow? Tomorrow was the last home game of the year. He wanted me to be, I wasn't eligible, but he wanted me to get used to the crowd and all that stuff and be, take part in pre-game warm-up. You know, put the pads, pads on. on the helmet for the first time. So that's how it got started. And I went out for spring practice and made a team. So, you know, obviously your journey has been one of fate and hard work and karma. How do you feel about, you know, the coincidences or the opportunities that have happened in your life to be, you know, one of the 
most well-known kickers in the NFL. Just a, a great career, unfortunately, against my Chargers a lot of the times. Um, but well, it was not to be, be predicted, obviously. Yeah. I came here to, to ski and ended up, uh, you know, uh, spending 19 years in pro football and then in the, in the Hall of Fame a few years after that. But, but I do remember when the coach told me, you know, what are you doing tomorrow? I always read about America, read about the land of opportunity, heard stories about the American dream. And the first thing that went through my mind was, well, this is, this is America. If the opportunity knocks, who knows what can happen? And that actually flashed through my mind That's when really he was cool. asking me that question, what, what are you doing tomorrow? And you still feel that way about America today? Yeah, I do. I, I, I don't think the American dream is quite as likely now as it was 15 years ago or 100 years ago. Uh, but I still believe that this is a great, great, great place to live. Probably the greatest place on earth to live. I don't know that for sure. I haven't lived in all the <laughs> other countries. Yeah. But I still believe, yes, I believe in America very much. I'm, ble you know, I'm blessed to travel all around the world. And the one thing I know is there, there's so many more people and maybe not as much opportunity, but I can't find another place in the world where if you come here with nothing or you're born with nothing, that you can end up being in a Hall of Fame or a multimillionaire or a world leader? Well, it has happened, it happens occasionally, but I, I still do believe though that it was, it was not quite as, I'm not quite as optimistic yeah. as 50 years ago. I will but be still, there. I believe in America. That's awesome. Now, being a kicker, one of the things that was most, is most impressive to me is how you handle pressure. And, you know, there, whether you knew the game or not, I don't know, uh, how you know people really want to know how you deal with the games on the line and here's these guys that have been playing although you think they were only playing four seconds at a time they've given their heart and soul some of them have given their consciousness and their knees well, and their by, the, by the time I got in the pros I knew that they were played more than four <laughs> seconds right. at a time <laughs> but anyway no. um, they find pressure that I have I have failed on one or two occasions I've, I've succeeded on most occasions in those situations but not only did they have the the, uh, your pride to, to do well, but you also had to, you know, you got to do it for the team. In addition to that, there's a pressure of keeping your job. Yeah. Because in those days, at least and in, in football to a large extent even now, uh, if you don't perform, you know, the, the basically what you're saying when you're signing a contract in pro football is saying, uh, this is your job, but we're going to try to find somebody better than you every week. And that's how the, the life is in the NFL. So. Not only is it the pressure of the game and the team as the, the fans, but also pressure of making a living. So, so how do you handle that? Uh, you do the best you can. Yeah, about, <laughs> and it well, helps well, to probably you have, you little, visualize to have a little bit of talent to, to, to go with it. You know, the odds are in your favor a little bit. But um, if you can't handle it, you're not going to be around very long. Did you visualize you kicking? No. You did it all? No, no, no. Just simply no, practice. I basically told myself, if I don't make this one, then maybe out of work. That's, so fear, <laughs> of, the fear, fear of failure probably kept me a lot more than anything else. Yeah, I, I bet. Now, taking we back, didn't have sports psychologists in those days. Yeah, I wore all these uh, 3D glasses to help you see the kicks. I know, it's amazing. What, um, now, you did say that you only kicked 13 attempts in college before you Well, were I was drafted. I kicked my senior year. Yeah. And I had 13 attempts. So what happened? One, one kick was from 59 yards. And, uh, and I made it, of course. And it was, school record? Well, it was more than a school record. It turned out to be that it was the longest kick in, pro, in, in football at that time. It broke the, oh, the pro record. record by three yards and the college record by five yards. And that's how the scouts around the league heard about me and found out about me. Do so you remember which kick it was? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. How many games in or how many kicks? No, it was actually the last, the last game of the year. Oh, so your last It was game. against the arch rival of the University of Montana. Although it was early in the game, it was actually the first score of the game made the score three nothing. And they cleared by quite a bit too. And, but anyway, then now 50 years later, sometimes people tell me, I remember when you came, kicked that 59 yard field goal to win the game against the Grizzlies. I said, well, it wasn't really the winning kick. It was the first score of the right. game. But, but 50 years, th things changed a little bit. Yeah, that's what As the story is being told. Right, Vita Blue used to always tell me, he said, the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> that's, a, that's an amazing thing. Now, um, if you didn't make that kick, the 59 yarder, do you think you would have been drafted? They may not have heard of me. Did they I may know? not have. Wow. But about a week or two after the draft is a big deal these days. As you know, we didn't have ESPN or <laughs> any of that stuff. But I just got a telegram at the end of the season. It was my name, K 
care of Montana State University Athletic Department. It just says, Congrat congratulations, you've been drafted in the third round of the AFL redshirt draft. And he was signed Jack Stedman, who was the president of the club. So, so the coach at Montana State said, you know, if you stay in, on this, in school, one more fall quarter. And if you have a good season, you could hopefully get drafted also by the NFL. And of course, that's what we made up, up our mind to do. So I stayed in school one more fall quarter. I had a good year. I, I think I set a record that year too, was for most points ever scored by a kicker. So now the NFL, at a special draft, though the 30 of us have been drafted as AFL redshirt in this redshirt draft the year before. This gets fairly complicated. Oh, that's okay. But anyway, I was then, when they had the draft after that season, the Atlanta Falcons picked me. I was actually the first one out of those 28, 30 guys to be picked in that special NFL draft. I just drafted those 30 guys that have been drafted by the AFL in their redshirt draft. So now I had a choice to make. The old established NFL, but of course Atlanta was brand new, or, or the AFL and the Kansas City Chiefs. Now if you were a general manager today or an owner, would you draft a kicker? Oh, I think so. Yeah. They, they, the now, they, over the, the years, there have been, there's been two or three that have been drafted in the yeah, first Jim round. Kowski, right. Yeah. yeah, and it was, uh, I, I can recall a couple other ones too. Yeah. Uh, but I really haven't thought about that if I would or not. <laughs> yeah. but, but you know, you get, well, if, you, if you have, you're a standout, if you stand out, you don't get drafted unless in the first round, unless you are better than anybody else in the country, in college, obviously. You, you live in a big football town. Are you a bigger football fan or soccer fan today? Oh, no, there's no comparison. American football is the greatest, most exciting team game ever invented. Now, I enjoy playing soccer, and soccer I played. Skiing, I did football. I didn't play that much. I kicked field goals, right? Here. So uh, so soccer, uh, I don't follow it that much. I enjoy playing it a lot. Sure. But American football, I cannot imagine a more exciting sport where things change all the time. You look like you're you, you going for the, the winning points, and then a tip ball, an interception, the, score goes, or the ball goes the other way, and the other team <laughs> scores. There's so many things, and momentum changing things that happens all the time. I think it's just the most entertaining sports that I've ever, ever seen by I, far. I also believe football, you know, I was blessed to play in college, and, you know, I didn't have the skill to make it farther, but that was my dream. I, I think football, of all sports, has so many lessons to teach us that have made me successful for the rest of my life. What's the number one lesson that you learned from football? Well, obviously teamwork is one of the biggest things that you learn, but also you have, to be, you have to be disciplined, you have to be committed, you have to do... I always thought when I ran the stadium steps here in the Arrowhead Stadium, I thought, well, it's probably raining in New York today, maybe that kicker is not running the stadium steps because the weather is too bad. <laughs> so I always used every opportunity to get managed and try to do more than and everybody else, at least what I thought they did. So you have to work very hard at it awesome. and, 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 and do the very best you can. And when you're young, you say that a lot, but you're looking back, I probably did work harder the older I got, I got and come closer to what I'm talking about right now. But, but also early on, I felt I was, uh, uh, I was accountable. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think I worked pretty hard at what I was, what I was doing. They've had great moments like all Hall of Famers, and I'm blessed to be a business partner with a Kansas City Hall of Famer as well, who played for a long time until he was 44 years old. Um, what, to, for, for you, you know, playing that, that long and seeing the evolution of the game and being a student of the game, wh where do you see the biggest change today in the game? Oh gosh, I don't know, it's been, I've watched it now for over 50 years. Yeah. And of course, when I got into the game, they talk about the start of this, this, this specializing the game a little bit. The, um, the squad limit went to 40 people on the team a couple of years before I got in the league. So, so from my standpoint, it was good timing because now they, had, that they had room now on the squad to have a kicker on the team instead of somebody to do, maybe play guard or even quarterback or wide receiver, still kick. So we started to specialize a lot more. And that was the beginning of that. Although, even in those years, I remember our defense, we had the same 11 guys on the field almost the whole time. Right. But it still be, it started again to specialize, and now it's, it's extremely specialized. And I was with uh, at the Chiefs training uh, practice facility the other day. They have a, a dietitian, you know, they, have, they have sports. Drink. Yeah, they have stretching coaches, they have weightlifting coaches, running coaches. 
I mean, they have every uh, you know, positive thinking, right. sports psychologist, all the stuff. So, 3D. And, 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 and the, the facilities and the training facilities uh, are just phenomenal. I was up in Minnesota also about a month ago, and they're building a new facility that is just absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. So the league is, uh, pro football is doing pretty well. It's, it's evident when you, when you see the stadiums and the, the facilities and the, it's a, it's a I mean, it's on the, it's on the cutting edge. All the, the, time. the old trainer in Minnesota, I remember John Randall told me one of my favorite stories when he was so afraid to go into the trainer to tell him he was hurt because he was old school, you know, the trainer. One time he hurt his hand and I think there was maybe even some fractures in it and the trainer took an aspirin, he scoffed at him, took an aspirin, taped it to the back of the hand and said, get back out to practice. Things have definitely changed over the years. Well, I assume that quite a bit. Some people would be like that today too because your job is always on the line. Yeah. But those backups in this league are pretty good. As a matter of fact, there's just a fine line between the, the starter and the backup a lot of times, as you know. And I think it's true in life and entrepreneurship, too. It's a fine line between the subtleties of success, and I think you've proved that. Last question, and I love to ask all Hall of Famers. You know, you've done so much not only on the field but off the field. I know we didn't get as deep into the philanthropic side of how many times you go to charitable events. I see you're, you're talking about different events that I've seen you and, and gotten to meet you. What legacy, when it's all said and done, do you want to leave? Oh, that's a hard question. I haven't, <laughs> Sorry I'm about not, that. I'm not old enough to think about that yet. <laughs> that's all right. You can start making no. a plan. <laughs> I know you're not a visionary. No, I haven't, do things. no I haven't thought about that. I just that uh, I think the most important thing is that you're a decent human being, I believe. That's awesome. You know, just keep it simple. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been my pleasure. We'll go skiing sometime. I Looking think it'll forward to it. Especially in Montana. Okay. I, I'm still, I still go to Bridger. So that's great. That's how my kids learn how to ski there. Yeah. Uh, pleasure. We're here at our AMP event. This is Dave Meltzer with Jan Stenerud here with Entrepreneur, The Playbook.